and welcome to Reading Aloud. And this week, multiple intelligences. Yes, we'll be looking at Howard Gardner's remarkable book and asking whether his notion that there are seven types of intelligence should have influenced learning theory the way it has. Well, you can clear off now so I can say what's coming up in the rest of the programme. The book that sparked a tense school vote on asylum seekers. More on intelligence. Just what is it? Intelligence is using one's brains. And author Babette Cole on the magic of reading. It's like Alice going to the looking glass. All I can say is, see you there. Hansworth wakes, but Hansworth never sleeps. And Soho Road is where the heart beats. The opening lines are one of Benjamin Zephaniah's most famous poems. And Benjamin was brought up just a few miles from this store in Birmingham, and now his second novel, Refugee Boy, is inspiring teachers and classes all over the country. The book tells the harrowing story of a father and son forced to flee Ethiopia while the country was in the middle of a bloody civil war. What kind of man are you? Alam's father shuddered with fear. His voice trembled as he replied, I am an African. Alam looked on terrified as the soldier shot a number of bullets into the floor. Turning back to Alan's father, he dropped his voice and said, Leave Ethiopia or die. It's a striking story that's had pupils at Stuart Bathurst School in Winsbury gripped for several weeks. The Year 7 class have been researching asylum issues, role-playing, carrying out internet research and, of course, reading the book they've reached the passage where the boy Alam and his father are facing extradition. We're now going to have a look at some of the facts surrounding refugees and asylum seekers. A lot of the students came to the lesson with a lot of preconceptions about what refugees were and what asylum seekers were. And when they looked at the statistics, they saw that on the grand scale of things, England takes in very few asylum seekers. And it was important for them to have an informed view. Imagine how difficult it must have been for Mr Kalo to let his son know that his mother was found hacked to death. There was a thud, and everyone in the courtroom turned to see what it was. Alan had collapsed in his seat and fallen forward. OK, that's all I want to read you for now. Anybody like to raise their hand and tell me why you think Alan reacted in that way? Michaela? Because he was shocked to find out that his mum had died in that way. Good, he hadn't been told the details of how his mother had died. So not only is he having to go into this courtroom and answer these horrific questions, that are basically saying that he and his father are lying about why they want to stay in England. He's also hearing the gruesome details about how his mother was killed. Now, you had a debate in the class. Can you tell me how that worked? The debate was about whether Alam should be allowed to stay in the country or whether he should go back to his homeland with his father. If he goes back to his own country, then there'll be memories of his mum and when he's died there. We're a rich country and they're poor and stuff. There's already jobless people here. Oh, too. They don't. We don't just give them everything. Yeah, they do. Stacy marshalled the arguments on the whiteboard. He can't go back because he wouldn't be accepted in any of the countries. Then she divided the class into opposing sides. Right, Year 7, we're now in our debating team. We've got our four team and against team. Can we hear the first speaker from the four team? If Alan returns, he faces death, just like his mother, and no one, especially a child, deserves to be sent to their death. People deserve to come to this country if they are tortured and threatened, not if they think we are a soft country and that they will get money out of us. If Alan went back, he could get locked up, killed or tortured. Refugees might have good reasons to come here, but they're still taking what's rightfully ours. We shouldn't be selfish and give what we've got, like, spare to them. In all the foreign people come, there will be no jobs left for the uh, English people who was brought up here. It all got quite heated as the class abandoned their scripts and threw themselves into the debate. to go back home with his father in his own country. The outcome of the debate was 11 to 12 for Alan to go back to his homeland with his father. They obviously went against what, as a teacher, I would have hoped they would have uh, voted. But that was such a good thing about the book because it was real. Um, the students did engage with it. They had honest feelings about it. Any children in your own school who are refugees? Yes, we have um, two students who have joined us very recently, actually. So I think it's given the students something to think about, um, that they don't know why these students have come over. They don't know the circumstances. I liked it because it showed the real-life situations, like um, the conflict and um, the bullying in the um, child's home that he went to. I liked how... There was conflict 
fact about his mother was a different race to his father and how he had to come to England and it was hard for him because he wasn't his fault. I didn't really like it that much because it's not like a, a book that interests me because I don't like books like where like wars happen and that I like like Harry Potter books and that. Now let's meet one of my favourite picture book authors, Babette Cole. She's illustrated and written over 70 books, including The Sprog Owner's Manual, The Smelly Book and The Trouble with Mum. Well, at a recent book signing, she gave us a sneak preview of her latest work. It's called That's Why and it'll be coming out next year and it's about why we were born. It's, um, I just sort of came to the conclusion that so many children didn't really have any hope or didn't think they had any hope and this gives people hope. There you go, Barry. It is a bit miserable in the beginning but it livens up a bit when a rather fat little all-singing, all-dancing stallion comes whacking through the council house window. <laughs> The characters in my books come from all walks of life. I just keep my eyes open. Sometimes they are based on people I know, especially the way they look. So just be careful. Don't rub me up the wrong way or you might end up as a villain. <laughs> <laughs> OK? Is it a good one? Oh, yes, that's a good one. <laughs> I think it's important to read anything you can, but unless you sow that seed very early on with picture books, you won't give the child the habit of reading. This, this is what's going wrong. Reading is a, a great pleasure, and it's like no other experience that anybody can ever have. It's like going through a door in your head, that magic wonderland. It's like um, uh, Alice going through the looking glass. All I can say is, see you there <laughs> if you're lucky enough to come. <laughs> what do we mean by intelligence? I'm sure the people around here in Birmingham are really bright, but would they say that a sportsman like David Beckham was intelligent. No. no. <laughs> he's not intelligent because you don't have to be clever to play football. The way he speaks, you don't seem intelligent, but he probably is intelligent, right? He wouldn't earn his living if he wasn't intelligent. He wouldn't score goals. But what if I said, look, he can put a ball on the ground and he can send it 30 yards almost exactly where he wants it to go. Is that intelligent? What would you say? He's got a talent, yeah. It comes under a different category. I don't know what I'd call it, but I think it comes under a different category entirely. Intelligence is something else. What's yeah, intelligence, do you think? Um, it's books and stuff. Is it what you know or what you can do? What you can do? Both. Both, yeah. You have to be clever and then you have to be what able you to can do, do it. Well. Intelligence is using one's brains. And just brains or brains and body? Oh, you've got to use both. Interesting, don't you think? Yes, I thought you did. Well, in 1983, Howard Gardner wrote a book that questioned the whole idea of intelligence being a single entity that could be measured via the IQ test. Instead, he identified seven kinds of intelligence. So, someone like David Beckham, who, as we've just heard, isn't someone who's usually regarded as intelligent, would be deemed to have bodily or kinesthetic intelligence. It was a book that truly created what we might call a paradigm shift in thinking. And seriously questioned the narrow way schools had traditionally tested and assessed children. But has it made a real difference? A question for our panel. Vicky, was there a way in which the book changed the way you think? Was there a before and after? I wouldn't say Gardner's book necessarily changed the way I thought at that moment in time, but my research has kind of followed this guideline and what I found out was generally what Gardner is stating here, that children learn in different ways. Um, and one of the good things I think that comes out of this book is that no child is uh, unable to learn something. It's just if, ch if children do well in tests, they're very academically minded. That doesn't mean to say that children who do poorly in tests haven't got any intelligence, it's just their intelligence is demonstrated in another form. Andrea, can you make any comparison? I think my comparison would be a, 
about how I was educated, which was very single intelligence and very much um, sort of IQ and academic, to how I then went into teaching and wanted to teach. Uh, there was some sort of revelation, I think, when, when, when I was doing my degree about that wasn't the way it should have happened and that's not the way that I would have, I would have learnt best and therefore changed my practice when I went into teaching. And I think in a way what Howard Gardner has done, and I think he almost admits this himself, is he's sort of described and picked up on existing what you might say is effective liberal practice and celebrated that and called it a theory with multiple intelligences. Well, I tell you what, let's test ourselves, shall we? Let's see whether we can remember his seven intelligences. We've got the logical, mathematical. He kicks off with that, saying that it's not really a hierarchy, but he will mention that one first, and that's the one that, <laughs> you know, if you pass all your exams, you're quite good at. And uh, linguistic, which is the other sort of traditional one. So oh, it's right. basically yeah, uh, maths and English, logical mathematic, and linguistic, which is the English yes. sort of language mm. one. The spatial one is for the engineers and surgeons and that. Uh, musical, uh, that would be Mozart, wouldn't it? Definitely. Uh, interpersonal and intrapersonal, I suppose interpersonal, well that's what we're doing now, isn't it? Yeah, and yeah. an intrapersonal is when you just think about yourself and you reflect upon. And that's really, I think, something that, that we are focusing on much more in schools. Yeah. That's self-knowledge and self-awareness and we, there is a danger that you go too far down that route in making children understand what type of learner they are and then only ever focusing on that. I mean, Gardner talks about that. There's the danger that you're going to push one child in one direction when that's not the direction they should be yes. going in. It brings up all these issues. Stick them in a the box and never get almost, out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And he yeah. admits it himself. Is he says, this could be used to label people. And the reason he doesn't like singular intelligences, you know, the IQ test, was because it just sort of sorted us at 11 plus or whatever it was into sheep and goats and he admits that it's a danger with multiple intelligences that the same thing can happen. So in a way Grant you're saying there are seven singulars and that's the danger isn't it? Uh, it's one of the problems I think if you uh, make assessment central to any sort of educational theory that actually if the assessment becomes central what you label children as can actually start to dominate the child. Wait a minute we've missed one out haven't we? David Beckham. Kinesthetic. Eye Bodily experience. Feet. Yes. Mm. Now, Vicky, you're looking at the ways in which children are creative in different ways. Do you find the ideas of Gardner constraining at all? Gardner's idea of this utopian school where every child is identified as a key learner and they can go off and learn in their own ways is a very good way of thinking. And equally valued. Yeah, but children need as many opportunities at all of these different intelligences. They need to be able to experience all of them and to develop in, in education before they can make a decision as to what type of learner they are. If we could start with the different ways of learning and then develop those into the curriculum, that would be really good. But the testing system definitely puts constraints on it because you're constantly thinking, well, this is fantastic and they're really enjoying it, and, but you've actually now you've got to sit down and you've got to do this and you've got to do that in order to, to, sort of, you know, to meet the coursework requirements. So the assessment regime is actually dictating back to the curriculum. Back to those two intelligences that were prioritised hundreds of years ago. Assessment is one major issue, but also it's the outside agencies such as Ofsted that cause panic amongst the schools because in theory this sounds excellent and it's something that everybody I think would like to approach. But all of these different intelligences do not involve children sitting at a desk quietly reading a textbook or getting on with a worksheet. They would involve the children moving around, lots of discussion, lots of a, a very busy atmosphere. And that is something that Ofsted have previously come crashing down on people for. You know, there's no calm atmosphere there. And I think teachers at the moment are still a little bit nervous of setting their children free. Well, after all that, I feel like a drink. You know, my favourite quote about intelligence comes from someone called La Rochefoucauld, who said, the height of intelligence is to conceal it. Well, that's it for now. See you next time. Cheers. Cheers.